But on the downside, this is a fairly outdated um, file. It's, it was published in the, in the 80s and 90s, um, or assembled in the 80s and 90s. And there hasn't really been a straightforward and easy way of updating it. Certainly, we do not have one editor being in charge of adding new institutions to this list. So what we're doing is we essentially uploaded the RNET list into the, um, um, into the database as an authority file. But then we give the ability to individual databasers to actually add institutions as we, as we need to do for, for our research projects. And obviously, this um, um, can result in really unpleasant things. This was just a ca test case up here, so this doesn't mean anything. But you could enter something like 1111 unknown unknown, which obviously is not very meaningful. But um, this is actually a field we use of a given specimen. It's not clear where it comes from, for example. So it, it, ha it happened. Okay, so this was all the, the actual data entry mode. Then we obviously always assume that you're entering um, specimen data into a database and you're going to be messing up. At least this is what I do a lot because you know, you're not as focused or it's like the end of the day as we heard earlier and you start making mistakes. So we felt it was very important to have an edit mode that's very easily accessible to every databaser and were errors that were made can be corrected very, very straightforwardly and simply. So this is why I said I typically, when I database specimens myself, I have the two windows open at the same time. I have the museum data entry mode and then I have the edit specimen mode. So there's different ways of searching for specimens that you have in, imported into the database. And let's assume you have a, um, a, a unique specimen identifier or a global unique identifier. You can search for that number, for example and then go to that particular record and then change all the information that um, you might have to update and then update that information. Um, you can also search for entire species, for example, um, and then look at all the specimens that have been entered under that particular taxon name and you can modify, for example, if a species name has been recently updated, for example, it moved from a manuscript name to an actual validated species name, you can just go in and, and change that information for all the specimens that have ever been um, entered under that particular species name. So it's quite, quite straightforward. There are certain other things that not every databaser can do where we think this is kind of dangerous, it gets into the core of the authority files, and this is only where an administrator or um, database users with administrative um, capabilities can actually make modifications. Okay, and you also see we have, um, whenever we have a little photo icon with um, a specimen, it means that we have an image for that specimen as well. So we'll talk about things like that later on. Okay, and then there's the third mode, and this is really where you write queries, um, where you can write reports, and this is also where you get all the specimen data out of the database for research purposes. So um, you can, in this case, for example, you can choose the family. So I'm, I'm using the, the queries a lot because you can look at um, what well, the specimen data that have been entered for a particular taxon, for example. In this case, we're looking for humorous and you can count the number of specimens that are in there. You can drill it down to say, I really only want to see specimens from a particular country, for example, and so on and so forth. And then you can write out things online, but you can also download everything as Excel spreadsheets if you need that. You can also, if you're interested in making maps externally using um, map software out there, you can um, get the coordinates downloaded for everything. Um, and you can also get host lists, for example, for the um, species that have been recorded with host plant labels or you know, for the parasitoids also with insect hosts. Um, another thing, and there was um, something we were interested in as well, was just trying to use, it, or at least initially during the PBI times, use a um, database also as a way of maintaining um, label information, label data. So we felt that field, um, field label or f um, yeah, field label data should be entered into the database first, and then we used the database to actually generate the um, insect specimen labels that there were. Um, um, stuck on each of the specimens, so that works really quite well. You need to you know, essentially write out a flat um, Word document and then you um, get it into label format. Okay, so obviously there's a lot of, lot of things to, um, to 
um, keep in mind when you're sort of databasing. So there's by now a fairly long and extensive document that gives you um, um, very clear instructions on how to use the database in addition to the little help buttons that we have in the different sections in the database that have some of the abbreviated um, instructions on there. Okay, one thing um, that um, I briefly want to mention that will also be important for um, one of the lectures I'm giving tomorrow is um, we felt it was very important to physically associate each specimen we're looking at with a unique, some kind of a unique code that we could make sure we can always track, keep track of that specimen. This is something that's important in our taxonomic work. If you have long lists of material examined, in many cases there will be many specimens coming from the same locality and the same collection event. But then in many cases, we're not going to be doing genital sections, for example, for, let's say, all the 10 males that were collected at one particular site at a particular collection event date. So we want to make sure that we can point to directly one specimen and say, this is really the information that comes from that specimen. So because it became very important for the taxonomic work we're doing to be able to point to individuals but then also, and this is something that comes up more and more out there in the ecological, behavioral, or even molecular world, that journals will ask you for not only voucher specimens and depositories, but they also ask you for uniquely identify each of these specimens so that anyone could go back at a later point, go to the collection where these specimens are and say, okay, you're the specimen where one of the hind legs was extracted for DNA studies. But the problem is when you um, identify that species, you actually didn't really know enough about that particular genus and you gave it the wrong species name, for example. So let's say five years later, someone else looks at this particular genus again and will be able to actually go back to that specimen and say, no, I know now this is actually a different species. So the whole molecular phylogeny might in the end actually make sense. So this is very important. Um, so this is part of our normal workflows that we would attach these um, specimen identifiers to each specimen. So we're using these matrix, matrix codes. So you have um, an, um, essentially a, a prefix that would point to a project that's capturing the data and then there's a number behind it and that unique code is encoded also in this matrix. Okay, georeferencing I'm not going to be talking about. We have um, different ways of doing that. Obviously the, the um, preferred thing is if a specimen label already comes with georeferences. In theory and practice, this probably doesn't happen um, too often, when you, especially when you look at older um, material, but we have a full day to talk about georeferencing. Um, just some of the, uh, um, quickly some of the outputs. So by now we, um, we um, assemble what we call, because most of the, um, the work has really focused on heteroptera, heteroptera species pages, where you see these distribution maps, you see all the images that are, have been uploaded for a particular species, and then you have the material examined section down there that you also again can download as an Excel spreadsheet. And this is publicly available, um, which is a good or maybe a bad thing, I'm not quite sure, because saying a bad thing because we're at this stage, the, uh, the database was really a research database, which means a lot of work in progress and species that were being described at this point or are still not described were entered in it. So obviously other people can see this information too. So it's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a um, contentious topic. Um, then we're also um, using different other um, avenues to, to map the species. What works really quite well for publication purposes are um, called simple mapper um, maps that are also directly linked to the database and they're not very beautiful maps but for a lot of things we're doing this is actually really good enough so it just gives you all the dots um, on the map. If you want more fancy things you can just um, download all the coordinates and then play with ArcGIS or other programs that make nicer maps obviously. Um, the, uh, the data aggregator we've been using since the beginning um, is called Discover Life and this is a site that's run by John Pickering. He's been working with a number of different databasing initiatives over time. Um, he's working together with GBIF as well. 
Um, and what we really liked about that, it was just a very, very easy and very simple way for us to, um, to display the data to the public before we even did any of the other, our own mapping tools or anything. So again, it would be a, a combination of uh, displaying some of the images and then showing the maps. So you look at that map and you might go like, um, well, I guess you can maybe also use, the, uh, use Discover Live as a way of data um, error checking because you might suspect that one of the databases did a really bad job with a taxon that obviously is um, distributed in a new world and all of a sudden there's a dot that's showing up somewhere in Southeast Asia. And yes, that's what we do actually. We do use Discover Live at some level for data and error checking of georeferencing. But in this case, this is actually that particular species and it's invasive not only in Hawaii and further down in South America, but it's also made it all the way over to Southeast Asia and by now it's known from Europe as well. So, interesting thing. And um, then you can use global mapper tool within Discover Life we need to list all the individual species so you see them color coded in different ways and you can look at the data this way. Okay, the, um, the other thing that we really liked um, about Discover Life at that point was that A, it was fairly simple for us to link it to what's called the online systematic catalog of Heteroptera, which the, the only working module at the moment is the one Melissa mentioned earlier, the, um, the catalog of Meridi, but there is a bunch of other catalogs that are being processed to become online resources at the moment. So it's linking to that directly, and then also it's a really neat way of showing um, host associations through Discover Life, just because um, John Pickering has been collaborating with a lot of botanical databasing projects as well. So you can actually list all the, um, all the hosts that a particular insect specimen has been recorded from, which comes obviously out of our database. But then you can also overlay that with information that the botanical information that comes from other projects. And you can also see um, images for the plants, for example. You can not only look at the distribution of the plants, but also images. And that in part would be images that we provided through our database, but it's also external images from other databases. So it's a pretty neat way of, of looking at things. Okay, then just, um, um, actually I'm gonna be skipping over that. I wanted to show you some other uses of the database, but they're just you know, more of the same essentially. So let's forget about that. Um, okay, so other than the, the Myriad and other Trubug people, who's been using that database? So there was one really big um, project, the so-called Bee Databasing Project, um, where <coughs> I would say one half of the project decided to use the Arthropod Easy Capture database the other half of the project that was based actually at uh, UCR didn't use the database, but they went with a FileMaker Pro database, not quite as, um, as convenient really in many ways, but what they did in the end was serve all the data combined from uh, the Arthropod Easy Capture database and that FileMaker Pro database to Discover Life again, so you can actually look at um, the specimen data from all around the world. Okay, there was an, um, um, a spider project, Onopid Spiders, and I'm really only mentioning that because they um, decided to actually invest into um, making that database better in certain quite important respects. So they really initiated these species pages and made a connection to simple mappers, so they're the reason we can actually do that. And then they also developed a really neat descriptive database um, that they've been using a lot for their spider descriptive work. And then um, they also created, um, obviously they started creating the species pages. Okay, lastly, the project that we're now involved in, the Tritrophic um, databasing project I mentioned before. So those are the people. So there are some plants and some hemiptera and parasitic hymenoptera involved in that really. So it's a, um, this is, those are really only the, um, the, the, leads, the leads of each of the projects. There's 34 collections.